Pound. Uh, how many of you have ever read Pound before? Some? Yeah. Uh, unlike Frost, uh, you, you are unlikely to have read much uh, uh, Pound, I think, uh, up to um, this point in your educations. Uh, and probably you are, you are un, uh, 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 unlikely to, to have much of a, a view of him in contrast to Frost or even Yeats, uh, who uh, uh, cuts such a um, particular and, and uh, remarkable public figure. Uh, Pound uh, can be hard to put together. Uh, he can be hard to um, get, a, get a picture of. Uh, what is Pound like? Um, what was he like? Uh, well, uh, this is a, uh, a hard question for some of the same reason that uh, the poems are hard. Uh, that is, <coughs> uh, Pound's poetry projects no determinate identity, uh, no determinate poetic voice, unlike those, those distinctive voices of Yeats and Pound. Oh, excuse me, Yeats and Frost. Instead, uh, in Pound, you encounter a multiplicity of identities, uh, a multiplicity of voices. Uh, th there's an interesting contradiction in this. Pound is a kind of fierce individualist. Uh, he believes in, he wants to honor as a political thinker and as a, uh, uh, as a poet, uh, as a reader, he wants to honor uh, a heroic and sovereign idea of the individual. Uh, at the same time, in his writing, Pound repeatedly divests himself of identity, of particular identity, uh, in order to enter or to be entered by other identities, other poets, other voices, uh, creators, uh, heroes. Uh, this is what he wants to give us access to as readers. Uh, Pound's uh, centrality in modern poetry repeats the kind of paradox I'm, I'm describing. Uh, that is, he is the one poet on the syllabus whom all the other poets knew, uh, had some kind of relationship with, some kind of contact. Um, on the one hand, uh, Pound was an individual of extraordinary personal charisma and force, someone who liked to and who had the power to tell other people what to do, uh, tell other people what to think uh, and what to value. On the other hand, uh, when you uh, study Pound, you're studying someone uh, remarkably open to others uh, uh, in friendship, uh, as a reader, uh, as a uh, thinker. <coughs> He's uh, someone who openly seeks alliance with others. Uh, he has, uh, we've already talked in our first uh, lecture, uh, had an important relationship to Frost. Uh, you remember Frost speaking of his sometime friend Pound, who uh, wants to write, as he puts it, caviar to the crowd. <coughs> um, well, uh, Pound is, is credited, uh, as I also suggested, with in many ways modernizing Yeats, uh, helping Yeats become um, the uh, uh, particular um, uh, voice that he did uh, in the teens and twenties. Uh, in Beinecke, there's a, a little letter, uh, a uh, handwritten pencil uh, letter from Pound to Hart Crane, which Hart Crane received when he was 18, I think, around your age, after he had sent his poems to the Little Review. And this is, this is a uh, letter from Pound which says about um, Crane's poems, It is all very egg. There is perhaps better egg, but you haven't the ghost of a setting hen or an incubator about you. I'm not sure what that means, uh, uh, but uh, uh, th this was a rejection slip, uh, and Crane kept it all his life uh, like a kind of diploma uh, that, uh, you know, in some way uh, he was a, a member of modern uh, poetry because he had gotten a rejection from Ezra Pound. 
Um, in fact, Crane's first book, if you go over to Beinecke um, uh, and you, you turn it over, it has uh, a um, uh, picture, uh, it has a portrait, uh, not of Hart Crane, but of Ezra Pound, uh, because it has a, an ad for, for Pound and his book Personae. Um, and and I, I like this fact because it's representative, I think, of, a, a, of, of Pound's importance and dominance and prominence uh, in uh, the poetic uh, culture of the 1920s uh, uh, and, and 30s. He was part of the world that a younger poet like Hart Crane uh, had to uh, uh, get to know and make his place in. Um, uh, one of the famous books about modern poetry, uh, one by Hugh Kenner, is called simply The Pound Era, as if modern poetry was all about Ezra Pound. Um, Ezra Pound, uh, born in Haley, Idaho, uh, in 1908. Uh, I, I, I like it that this uh, uh, wildly uh, cosmopolitan uh, expatriate intelligence was born in Idaho. <coughs> Uh, he uh, left the United States. Um, um, oh, he wasn't born in 1908. When was Pound born? He left the United States in 1908. Look, look in your, your 80, yeah, 1885. Thank you. <coughs> um, uh, he, uh, uh, he left um, the U.S. in 1908 uh, and lived mostly in London. Uh, where, um, at that point, um, where he uh, acted as the foreign editor of uh, Poetry Magazine uh, and the Little Review, two little magazines that I've shown you uh, pictures uh, of uh, and that uh, were um, important in bringing modern poetry to the United States. Uh, Pound is the central figure in that process. He goes out and finds and interprets and explains and even, in the case of imagism, names the poetry that uh, he is uh, uh, bringing um, to American readers. He is the, uh, the entrepreneur, if you like, behind imagism. And then uh, when Amy Lowell takes over imagism, vorticism becomes his thing. Uh, and uh, uh, the magazine Blast becomes, for a while, uh, his organ. Uh, he, he writes uh, manifestos. Uh, he organizes groups uh, all the time, uh, abandoning them too. His poem, Hugh Selwyn Moberly, uh, composed uh, in 1920, looks back on this whole uh, period in London um, and um, uh, is, a, is a kind of, um, um, uh, well, summary uh, of um, the poetry of this period uh, and his involvement in it. Uh, and uh, it, it is itself a kind of um, early model for another great poem, The Wasteland, uh, which um, Eliot would, uh, as he composed it, bring to Pound to uh, edit. And we'll talk about that process in a bit. In 1924, uh, Pound moved to Italy. Um, there um, he uh, became uh, urgently concerned with economic reform uh, in the United States and in the West uh, generally. Uh, he uh, uh, is, in this period, uh, working on his great poem, uh, his long poem, which I'll be discussing today, The Cantos. Uh, he became uh, increasingly involved in Italian fascism, uh, which he uh, found a um, um, powerful uh, uh, vehicle of uh, his own economic ideas, uh, in particular. Uh, he made broadcasts in support of um, Mussolini's government uh, on fascist uh, radio uh, in the 1940s, and in 1945, at the conclusion of the war, was arrested for treason uh, by the United States Army. Um, the uh, charge of treason was, was dropped uh, when uh, he was um, uh, found to be uh, um, insane uh, and um, hospitalized uh, at uh, St. Elizabeth's Hospital in Washington, D.C., where 
uh, he would, in a very peculiar way, hold court uh, a great man of letters uh, at the uh, center uh, of, um, uh, well, um, the American capital, uh, entertaining uh, Elizabeth Bishop uh, and other uh, figures whom we will read. Um, at, this, at the time of um, uh, Pound's institutionalization, uh, his uh, poem, The Peace and Cantos, uh, a late stage of the cantos, uh, was selected as the first winner of the Bollingen Prize, uh, an uh, award initially given by the Library of Congress. Uh, when Pound, um, traitor to the nation, uh, was uh, awarded this prize for the best American poetry, <coughs> uh, an enormous uh, literary and cultural controversy uh, sprang up, uh, uh, which people go on arguing about. Um, well, uh, here is um, uh, a, uh, a poet uh, uh, who, by his own declaration, an example uh, seems to be uh, a fascist sympathizer, an anti-Semite. Could he write great poetry, uh, even great poetry that expressed fascistic uh, and anti-Semitical uh, views? Uh, if he could write that great poetry of that kind, should we honor it? Um, if he was mad, is there some way in which his poetry might not be mad? Well, these are, are questions that, that uh, have uh, uh, persisted, uh, and as I say, people go on arguing about them. Um, the um, um, uh, controversy uh, created so much trouble, the Library of Congress didn't want anything to do with the award anymore, and it moved to Yale. Uh, and uh, the uh, Beinecke Library has been administrating this, the mm, arguably the most uh, prestigious of uh, uh, poetry prizes ever since. Uh, and in fact, um, the judging for this year's uh, award is uh, going uh, strong at the moment, and there will be a new winner uh, at the end of the week. Well, uh, Pound's anti-capitalism, his uh, uh, his economic ideas, I think, are uh, in some ways the intellectual origin of both his interest in fascism uh, and the anti-Semitic views that uh, he expresses both in poetry and often in prose. <coughs> uh, Anti-capitalism. For, for Pound, uh, this derives from uh, really a specific cultural setting, that is, um, late 19th century American culture, uh, uh, a culture where, as Pound experienced it and, 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 and saw it, uh, art was conceived as a decorative art, uh, subject to the editorial tastes of popular magazines like The Atlantic uh, uh, or Harper's, <coughs> um, uh, a culture in which poetry was a kind of commodity. Uh, uh, which status destroyed uh, the uh, uh, potential for uh, originality and which subordinated art to, uh, to money. <coughs> when, when Pound expatriates, when he, uh, when he leaves the United States, uh, he's fleeing not only America, but he's, uh, as he understands it, he's, he's fleeing American money. <coughs> uh, and what he is entering uh, what he's going to, um, he conceives as a particular kind of tradition, uh, a kind of historical community, uh, which he describes uh, in that first uh, quotation on your handout, uh, a uh, uh, quotation that um <coughs> in which Pound replies in a, in a uh, wonderfully haughty way, to the motto of Poetry Magazine, a motto that comes from the that great American poet Whitman, uh, to have great poetry, there must be great audiences, too, to which Pound says, it is true that the great artist always has a great audience, even in his lifetime, but it is not the vulgo 
that's us. Uh, but rather, the spirits of irony and of destiny and of humor, the great authors of the past sitting beside him. Uh, Pound, I, I think, in, in, a, in a very uh, almost uh, literal sense, uh, conceived of his audience as uh, uh, a, a kind of distinguished community of readers and writers existing across time, a kind of trans-historical community of artists. Um, ideas that we'll want to compare with Eliot's ideas of tradition, which are related but a little different, uh, next week. Well, um, let me move to uh, the second uh, quotation, also from this same period, 1914. Pound says, there's no use in a strong impulse in poetry. Strong impulse, I think he means uh, strong feeling, strong motive, uh, emotion, uh, if it is nearly all lost in bungling transmission and technique. This obnoxious word that I'm always brandishing about, technique, means nothing but a transmission of the impulse intact. In Pound, there's an emphasis, as we saw last time in looking at his rules for writing imagist poetry, there's an emphasis on the priority of poetic technique uh, and the importance of technical knowledge. Uh, but, uh, as this quotation suggests, and it's important to keep in mind, technique in Pound is always in the service of intensity, immediacy, or what he calls the, the impulse. Uh, there are further quotations from Pound uh, describing his technical aims. Uh, as I suggested uh, a few uh, uh, minutes ago, Pound moves on from imagism to what he calls vorticism. Uh, now, uh, instead of uh, um, wanting to get at uh, a poetry that is uh, centered on the image, he imagines a poetry centered on now the vortex, as he calls it. And there's a, there's a kind of definition of the vortex there in the third quotation. Uh, not so much later, he would replace the idea of the vortex with another um, related image, uh, which is the ideogram. Uh, we talked about some of Pound's translations from the Chinese and Japanese last time. Pound was interested in um, uh, Chinese writing uh, systems uh, as, well, you can imagine how uh, the ideogram appealed to a poet who wanted to imagine a poem as um, an image of a thing. Uh, here, uh, as Pound understood it, uh, not always uh, with um, uh, superb scholarly uh, uh, precision, uh, the Chinese uh, uh, word uh, was, in fact, an image of a thing. And, and this, this is very much a kind of uh, aesthetic ideal for Pound, who wanted um, language to give us a kind of immediate access to the things of the world. Well, um, I asked you to read for class today one of uh, Pound's poems from the teens, one of his famous poems, uh, a poem <coughs> uh, called The Seafarer, um, identified in your RAS packet uh, as from the Anglo-Saxon. I'll, I'll read just the, the beginning of it for you. May I, for my own self, songs truth reckon, journeys jargon, how I, in harsh days, hardship endured oft. Bitter breast cares have I abided, known on my keel many a cares hold, and dire sea surge, and there I oft spent narrow night watch nigh the ship's head while she tossed close to cliffs. Coldly afflicted, my feet were by frost benumbed. Chill its chains are, chafing sighs, hew my heart round and hunger begot 
mere weary mood, lest man know not that he on dry land loveliest liveth, list how I, care wretched, on ice cold sea, weathered the winter, wretched outcast, deprived of my kinsmen, and so on. Uh, iambic pentameter? Uh, you've been working on it. Uh, no, uh, it's not. Uh, what you're listening to is something very different. Uh, the sound is rough, like frost, and too, like frost, uh, in this poetry, Pound is writing against the beautiful, sonorous forms of late 19th century poetry. Uh, but Pound's poem, unlike Frost, is the very furthest from the vernacular that we could possibly get. Uh, what we have here is Pound translating from the Anglo-Saxon and providing a contemporary equivalent of uh, Old English alliterative verse, a particular uh, verse form, a dead poetic form, you could say. <coughs> uh, uh, although Pound revives it and, and in fact, brings it into um, uh, usage uh, in, in 20th century poetry. Uh, this uh, verse form, I've given you John Hollander's um, um, helpful self-descriptive definition uh, at the bottom of your handout where Hollander says, the oldest English accented meter of four unfailing, fairly audible, strongly struck stresses seldom attended to anything other than definite downbeats. In other words, in uh, uh, Old English verse, you don't count syllables. You just count strong stresses. And uh, there are, as a rule, four per line. And the lines, like Hollander's here, like Pound's that I just read, tend to divide uh, in the middle. Uh, there's a caesura that breaks uh, the, uh, uh, the line in two, uh, and, and Hollander goes on uh, describing it. Um, in addition to these strong stresses, the um, uh, line is held together by alliterative links uh, that join um, the words, um, you know, strongly and audibly um, in the, uh, across the caesura. Pound is an avant-garde poet. He's an experimentalist. Uh, here we have the strange and very interesting spectacle of the self-consciously modernist, avant-gardist artist writing in an archaic, dead poetic form. Uh, in the teens, uh, Pound is writing a kind of experimental poetry that in many different ways uh, seeks alternatives to 19th century norms of poetic practice, seeks alternatives to romantic sentiment, uh, poetic diction, uh, smooth musicality, uh, all, all of the, the, the virtues and vices that you find in, in early Yeats. Uh, what he does is open poetry to a range of styles and forms, many of them archaic, uh, many of them uh, from languages outside of English. Uh, you see Pound writing his version of the Provencal troubadour song, Canzone. Uh, we talked last time about um, Pound's version of Chinese or Japanese poems. Uh, he writes his own versions of Roman poetry or here Old English. Uh, through technical means, uh, through Pound's technique, he gains access to cultures and voices. Uh, he revives past voices, like the seafarer poets, uh, revives and, and implicitly identifies with them. Here is an expatriate poet writing about um, a uh, uh, writing in the voice of the Anglo-Saxon um, wanderer, uh, a figure deprived of his kinsman uh, who is out in the elements, 
um, uh, far from land, uh, far from uh, his nation and home. Uh, writing uh, in the voice of the seafarer Pound um, allies himself with what is historically um, prior, uh, and in fact, in English, he al allies himself with what is historically primary, uh, with the oldest English uh, poetry. Uh, here he claims it for himself, uh, carries it uh, forward, or as he would put it, transmits the impulse uh, in an act of translation. Uh, Pound's slogan, Make It New, a uh, kind of motto for modernism, uh, it's important to, uh, uh, to hear that injunction to make it new uh, as a specifically historical mission to uh, revive and uh, transmit uh, the past in a living way. Uh, the phrase itself, make it new, was translated from uh, the, uh, the ancient Chinese uh, and uh, uh, is itself, a, in that sense, um, an instance of what it describes. <coughs> uh, Pound's conception of the poet is as one who brings the impulse, as he calls it, uh, forward across time, um, uh, does so in a kind of imaginative act of seafaring, if you like, uh, leaving home, going out, crossing over. <coughs> uh, <coughs> Pound is um, a distinctive uh, and, in a sense, quite peculiar thing. He is a kind of visionary scholar. He is an epic poet of the library. Uh, there's a certain kind of contradiction in this. That is, a contradiction, or tension at any rate, um, between Pound's drive towards immediacy, uh, towards uh, um, well, his wish to convey uh, an emotional impulse and the highly mediated nature uh, of his vision. Um, Pound, uh, Pound's poetry is full of uh, learned uh, and abstruse reference. Unlike the Norton Anthology, if you pick up a, a volume of Pound, you'll find no footnotes. He just gives you the thing. Uh, he gives you no help with it um, because, I think, there is um, an intention in the poetry to somehow give you a kind of unmediated access to the materials that Pound is, is drawing on. He wants us to feel the excitement he feels when he sits down in the library and opens a book. <coughs> um, directness, intensity, <coughs> purity, immediacy. Uh, these are all Pound's aims, and he achieves them through an intensely mediated display of technique. Um, well, uh, you might contrast again Frost. Uh, Frost is always concealing, as it were, his um, uh, his expertise, uh, his, uh, his technical uh, knowledge, whereas uh, Pound is always showing it. Uh, in the case of the seafarer, Pound has used uh, Sweet's Anglo-Saxon Reader, his college textbook, uh, to write this poem. It's one he's taken to Europe with him. Now, uh, there are several consequences for all of this. Uh, one, in Pound, there is the idea that there are no dead forms. There are no dead languages. Uh, there are only derivations, variations, translations, uh, through which the past is continuously being made present. Uh, two, that is, the past is continuously available for those who can recognize it and seize it, uh, specifically through technical uh, powers, uh, technical powers which yet in the process must be transcended in order to achieve the kind of immediacy uh, and power that he seeks. Um, in effect, 
Pound makes technique a form of inspiration. This is, this is an interesting turn in literary history. Uh, the visionary poet in Pound is a scholar poet. Uh, literary technique is in Pound a secular means of evoking literary inspiration. Uh, literary inspiration in the form of prior literature. Uh, prior literature seen and felt as sacred. Uh, uh, as sacred, not as in Milton, uh, a divine authority, but um, rather an authority um, uh, to be recognized and felt and seized in books. The footnote, the scholarly index, the library archive, uh, these are the muses that Pound appeals to. The used bookstore, uh, these are the places that his poems come from. Uh, the result is a body of work uh, that is always uh, returning us, its readers, to its sources. Um, in the very first lecture, I referred to uh, what I see as two very general uh, and different uh, competing drives or, or forces in, in modern poetry. Uh, one uh, centripetal, uh, the other centrifugal. Uh, one a kind of uh, will on the part of modern poets to order poetry itself. Uh, on the other hand, a will to order the world, uh, order society. Uh, the artist must be concerned with art's own problems, on the one hand. Uh, on the other hand, uh, in Pound and in others, uh, the artist is a kind of, well, legislator, to use Shelley's image. Uh, he uh, has a truth uh, that he wants to uh, promulgate uh, that will order society properly. Um, Pound embodies these, these uh, two drives, as I'm calling them, uh, more clearly, uh, better than anybody. Uh, and they're, they're part of his uh, interest uh, and, and power uh, and, and some of the challenge that he uh, gives us, uh, both uh, uh, aesthetic uh, challenges and, and moral and, and, and uh, political ones as, as we think about his career. Uh, on the one hand, uh, in, in Pound, uh, there's, there's a kind of drive to identify that which is most essential to literature uh, and to tell Pound, uh, Pound's readers how to write poems. This is, this is the, the Pound who wrote those remarks about imagism that we talked about last time. On the other hand, uh, there is uh, the Pound who wants to extend the reach of literature, who wants to, who writes letters to statesmen, uh, who uh, uh, goes on fascist radio uh, to uh, tell the world uh, how things should be. <coughs> uh, this is also the poet uh, who, in his poem, The Cantos, wished to create a poem that would, as he calls it, include history. That, what an ambition, right? Extraordinary. Um, uh, so on the one hand, you have, have the, the poet of uh, In a Station of the Metro, the shortest poem uh, in, in modern poetry. And then you have the poet of the Cantos, the longest poem uh, in uh, modern poetry. Uh, uh, Pound is both of these things. Uh, and uh, these impulses that we see in that poem, and in that short poem, and in that long poem, they don't just compete in him, they exist, I think, uh, in some kind of collaboration. Um, the In a Station of the Metro identifies the image as the primary unit of uh, poetry. And in Pound's practice, it becomes a kind of building block for larger forms uh, and uh, for uh, the epic uh, itself. Uh, he says uh, here um, in your handout, uh, in a letter to Joyce, uh, 
Um, I have begun an endless poem of no known category. True. <coughs> uh, Phanopea or something or other. All about everything. True. Uh, I wonder what you, Joyce, will make of it. Uh, well, Phanopea means specifically image making. Uh, and you could understand the cantos as they unfold as a kind of uh, um, series of imagist poems. Um, uh, uh, as the image becomes this uh, fertile um, principle uh, that produces and generates more and more images, uh, more and more voices. Uh, the cantos had, um, well, he says, of no known category. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's true. Uh, it's hard to identify the genre of the cantos, although I've been calling it an epic so far. Uh, there's a sense in which in each canto, Pound is inventing the form of uh, the poem anew, uh, uh, inventing it uh, in response to the demands of new materials. The way to understand this great and, and maddening and somewhat mad poem, uh, which is one of the great works of, of modern poetry uh, in which we're reading just the smallest fragment, one way to, to understand it uh, is as the record of one man's reading, uh, one man's uh, encounter with many voices and his incorporation of them and engagement and conversation with them. Uh, the title of the poem is worth perhaps dwelling on for a moment, the cantos, uh, the songs, really, that's what it means. Uh, the title foregrounds literary activity itself, uh, foregrounds acts of singing, uh, which are uh, here, as Pound imagines it, a kind of renewable uh, practice uh, or process uh, that can't be reduced to a particular image or symbol. So in that sense, this poem is unlike The Wasteland or The Bridge, uh, which you know, pr produce these uh, specific central symbols around which uh, all the poem's ideas and images are organized. Pound uh, instead gives us uh, something more like a process. Uh, Pound, uh, as I say, uh, spoke of it as a poem including history. Uh, well, um, uh, this makes it sound as if the poem were you know, larger than history, uh, somehow a kind of frame for history that would help us understand and order it. Uh, well, maybe Pound wished this, but that's not what he produced. Uh, the poem lacks an organizing view of history such as you find in Milton or Virgil uh, or Homer or Dante. Uh, it would be therefore much more accurate to call it a poem that is in some sense continuous with history, that's like history. Uh, uh, in that sense, uh, a poem that is structurally unbounded, uh, 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 this, this is, I think, the view of history it projects. History not as a story of progress uh, or uh, Yeatsian apocalypse and cycles, uh, but history rather as something like the poem itself, something that accumulates uh, and repeats itself uh, with variations and without a definite aim in view. Um, history in this sense is something that can be entered. Uh, but not begun, uh, and it can't ever be completed either. Uh, and this is true of this poem. And then went down to the ship, set keel to breakers, forth on the godly sea, and we set up mast and sail on that swart ship, bore sheep aboard her, and our bodies also heavy with weeping, and winds from sternward bore us onward with belly and canvas. Circe's this craft, the trimmed quaffed goddess. Then sat we amidships, wind jamming the tiller. Thus with stretched sail we went over sea till day's end. Sun to his slumber, shadows o'er all the ocean. Came we then to the bounds of deepest water, to the Cimmerian lands and peopled cities covered with close webbed mist 
unpierced ever with glitter of sun rays, nor with stars stretched, nor looking back from heaven, swartest night stretched over wretched men there. The ocean flowing backward came we then to the place aforesaid by Circe. When I was a student, I, I said to uh, uh, my teacher, uh, I don't really get Pound, it's, and it's not very beautiful uh, either. Uh, and he said, well, take a look at this, uh, and, and produced uh, those lines I just read, which are magnificent, heroic uh, poetry. Um, they begin with that word, and. They begin with the conjunction, and. They begin with the conjunction and without a grammatical subject. And then went down to the ship. Who went down to the ship? Pound doesn't say. Uh, he introduces the poem with an action, an action uh, that is itself part of a series. Um, the action that we are being introduced to here is Odysseus's journey to hell uh, in search of Tiresias, uh, the prophet, uh, among the souls of the dead. He wants to learn, Odysseus wants to learn his uh, future course and decide how to act. Odysseus, we learn as the poem unfolds, uh, is the first speaker uh, pound accesses and, and, and uh, gives to us. Um, which is to say that we're reading a translation, again. Uh, and how does Odysseus speak? Not like Tennyson's Ulysses uh, in sonorous blank verse, but rather, as I think you could hear uh, readily enough, uh, in the Anglo-Saxon alliterative verse form of the seafarer. Pound is doing something very interesting uh, and exhilarating. He is translating what he conceives of as the uh, oldest passage in the Odyssey, uh, the, that most archaic uh, of poetry in the West, and translating it uh, using um, that poetry most uh, archaic in English. Uh, the uh, language and rhythms uh, and patterning of the seafarer. This is a kind of you know, overlay in technique, uh, again, uh, of Old English alliterative verse uh, and Homer's Greek. Um, these linguistic forms uh, in the poem are, are merged as if by a kind of parataxis, which I talked about last time, uh, to produce what Pound calls, uh, when he's writing about the image, as a complex, uh, a, a complex of elements that are held together in an instant, uh, an instant that, as he understood it, transcends space and time limits. Uh, this is all set out, again, in the doctrine of the image. <coughs> uh, and and we, we talked about another instance of that uh, kind of cultural overlay uh, of uh, materials in uh, the little poem, In a Station of the Metro. Contrast what Pound is doing here with what Joyce does in Ulysses. Uh, in Ulysses, uh, Joyce is, in a sense, carrying um, uh, Homer's text uh, into contemporary Dublin. Uh, he's you know, naturalizing it and modernizing it. Um, Pound, in a sense, is doing just the opposite. Uh, he is uh, going back, uh, and indeed here the sea flows backward, <coughs> uh, and it, it uh, takes us back to, uh, again, primary terms, uh, archaic Greek, uh, archaic uh, English. He is seeking to reappropriate uh, the heroic mode uh, through translation uh, in uh, yet a contemporary idiom. This is a kind of raising of the dead, <coughs> uh, a kind of journey to the literary and cultural underworld uh, that brings Pound's adventure as a poet 
uh, into line with Odysseus's. I mean, you can see, in other words, what Odysseus is doing now as he goes to the underworld and seeks prophetic speech from Tiresias as a version of what Pound is doing as he uh, seeks to translate the Greek uh, at the inception of his epic. Pound's own display of technique you could understand as a kind of uh, version of the ceremony to uh, honor and pay tribute to through blood sacrifice uh, that Odysseus practices here uh, in the pages that follow uh, as he induces uh, Tiresias to appear and, and speak. <coughs> Um, literary tradition here uh, has itself taken the place of the transcendental source of authority that was classical uh, or the Christian muse. Uh, here, Pound, uh, in a sense, turns back upon poetry itself uh, as a uh, sacred source. Here, uh, at a moment uh, in the epic where invocation would ordinarily uh, stand, uh, at the you know, point of uh, inception. Uh, here, uh, technique is uh, imagined uh, as a kind of process of translation uh, through which uh, speech from elsewhere is uh, brought forward uh, in time uh, and, in some sense, um, carried across uh, the waters. Um, again, there's a sense of contradiction, however, or tension. Pound wants to elicit speech from the dead, to make uh, the tradition's language new. He wants to transmit the impulse. Uh, he also insists, however, cannily and, and provocatively on the mediated quality of his words. Uh, Tiresias speaks uh, at the uh, um, uh, top of page 370, uh, towards the end of the poem, he says to uh, Odysseus when he sees him, a second time, why, man of ill star, facing the sunless dead in this joyless region, stand from the foss, that is, the ditch, uh, leave me my bloody beaver for sooth say, and I stepped back, and that eye there is the eye of Odysseus, and he, strong with the blood, said then, Odysseus shalt return through spiteful Neptune, over dark seas, lose all companions. And then Anticlea, Odysseus' mother, came. And then a remarkable thing happens. Uh, someone says, lie quiet, Divus. I mean, and now the eye is the eye of Pound, the narrator, the speaker, not Odysseus. I mean, that is Andreas Divus in Aficina uh, Vecoli, 1538, out of Homer. This is Pound stepping into the poem saying, I have been translating all of this from Homer, and I have been using the first, uh, uh, well, the, the, the Latin translation uh, uh, of uh, Andreas Divus uh, that uh, uh, I bought in a Paris book stand, uh, and this has been my source for this text. And it is uh, Divus that I have, the translator that has been my uh, muse uh, and who has been speaking here uh, through Tiresias, uh, if you like. <coughs> and it's his soul that is laid back and to rest. Uh, and at this moment, um, Pound continues, uh, now speaking of Odysseus in the third person, and he says, and he sailed by sirens and thence, outward and away, and unto Circe. Um, uh, finally, uh, the journey continues. Uh, here, uh, uh, again, uh, Odysseus's journey being analogized implicitly to the uh, journey that the translator is effecting as he brings the text uh, forward in time across from oral culture to print. Uh, from Greek to Latin and Latin to English and Old English. Uh, and then uh, in a uh, remarkable efflorescence that uh, ends this first canto uh, with uh, a macaronic display of languages, Pound says, venerandum in the Cretans phrase. Again, he's opened his, his book, uh, uh, and, and at the back of uh, uh, Divis's translation, he's found um, uh, the uh, 
uh, Homeric uh, hymns, uh, and now he's going to give them to us with the golden crown Aphrodite, Cypri Munimenta Sortita Est, Mirthful Oracalci, with golden girdles and breastbands, thou with dark eyelids bearing the golden bow of Argacida, so that, colon. The poem ends here with uh, a prayer to the goddess of beauty, Aphrodite, who is invoked here in Greek and Latin, uh, who is uh, brought forward and who is named Argacida, uh, killer of the Greeks, uh, slayer of the Greeks, presumably because she has uh, uh, had her hand in uh, uh, the abduction of uh, Helen and uh, the war in Troy. Uh, um, here, uh, uh, Pound has uh, uh, invoked the goddess uh, in these ways uh, and then concluded his canto uh, with the interesting grammatical form, so that, and the interesting punctuation, colon. Uh, in effect, if the poem began with and, it now ends with so that, where the colon is a kind of uh, gateway through which uh, the rest of the poem and implicitly uh, following uh, Homer, the rest of history, uh, will pass. Uh, and here Pound has established his poem and established his own role uh, as, in some sense, uh, a mediator um, conducting uh, a, a process by which um, the, the uh, uh, sources of the past are uh, brought forward uh, into uh, the future, uh, relaying what he calls the impulse and, in the process, making it new. Well, uh, let's stop uh, and we will um, uh, go on to, as I say, the related and different uh, poetry of T.S. Eliot next week.